Okay, so let's try this again. Hello. And what we're talking about here is the early 20th century. Before, you know, we were looking at overarching, you know, decade and century spanning styles. Now those styles are changing even faster with an ever changing and more quickly changing world. With World War One, World War Two, you know, the Great Depression, all of these things here changing how we live, how we see, how we think even in some ways, art must do its best to stay afloat and to survive in this changing world. Before this, you had in the late 19th century the the invent the camera post impressionism and impressionism of course rocking the world of art and how how pictures were constructed how they were read why they were constructed um, and those influenced these two men Pablo Picasso and Henry Matisse now there's no other artist in our textbook that spans multiple chapters that alone says something about the genius or the talent or whatever you want to call it of Picasso and for much of the 20th century these two men influenced other image makers now Matisse himself didn't change styles didn't you know experiment with sculpture and all these other things he simply played well I say simply but it's not simple at all he was a colorist. He explored what color could do. Now, Picasso's early style, one of his earliest recorded styles is the blue period. Looking at this image, you have the man covered in blue, withdrawn on himself, the man himself rather gaunt. This doesn't look like he's jamming out to Freebird or the national anthem Ala Jimi Hendrix. You know, this is indicative or this is reminiscent of a homeless man playing for money. A homeless man or a man simply in mourning. By looking down at himself, he's not acknowledging the world. He's, hol he's seemingly holding on to the guitar for life. And like Van Gogh, who painted every that one self-portrait that where everything was in blue, much of this is in blue except for perhaps the guitar. The guitar is that source of life and that face, that searching is that source of life in Van Gogh's self-portrait. So here, early on, we don't have much abstraction. We have simply, um, again, a filtered view reminiscent of the post-impressionists. Post-impressionists, we have that use of color reminiscent of the post-impressionists and the symbolists. And we have a very somber painting of a man. Later on, there's Wallace Stevens. But at, the, at, at this time, there's, an, there's another bombshell, at least to the world of art. And that is Africa. And that search to be the next original that searched to be the next innovator. Now when you look at this sculpture, this is incredibly different than what came before. Whether it was neoclassical, romantic, impressionistic, or post-impressionistic, none of them broke the image down to shapes so simple. Let's just look at it in detail. Using simple geometric shapes, we haven't seen a practice like this since perhaps the ancient Near East or you know anything far far before 0 AD and so this of course influenced artists at the time it showed them a new way of of depicting things this led to primitivism and of course these these sculptures these masks influenced artists in Europe and elsewhere now, let us look then at Matisse and what he was doing early on. Drawing strong influence from the symbolists, he pushed that expression of emotion, he pushed that idea of non-local color to another level. 
so much so this new trend became, or this new style became known as Fauvism, the wild beasts. Non-local color, bright values, strong emotions, and still clinging, still clinging to looking like something, still clinging to a representation of something or someone. Looking at this in more detail, we can see the the quickness in which the paint was applied, how some paint was just left raw rather than being mixed with other colors, and while the colors are bright, they still express that forlorn, somewhat sad expression that seems to be on the woman's face as she looks back in reflection or looks back in judgment. So that's one of Matisse's earlier endeavors. Taking those colors and simplifying shapes even further, we move to the joy of life. Now here we see this simplification, this breaking down of, of color into you know large basic shapes. But here he's taken it a step further um, and moved on to really simple flat shapes. And if you look in your textbook, you, towards the end of that chapter, you will find a piece called Icarus, in which you know here there's still an there's still an implication of forward and behind, front and back, near and far. But in Icarus, it's just simple, flat pieces of paper. And for so long, man has tried to create a window. You know, with the painting, they tried to create a window that leads back to infinity. But through this abstraction, that window becomes more and more shallow. And like in Icarus, to the point where it becomes completely flat. But we, we as viewers, recognize and can assign depth as we need, rather than having it described or, um, you know, illustrated in manners like shading and so forth and so on. So that's what's happening with Matisse and Picasso. In Germany, you have the German Expressionists who were less concerned. There, it's not so much about looking exactly like something. It's not so concerned with structure. It's more concerned with the emotional, the feeling of color. Now, if you've ever been to a really big city, and I guarantee you, Little Rock is not a big city. It's not to say it's bad, it's just it's not Los Angeles. It's not Chicago. It's not New York City. If you've ever been to a large city like that, you'll know that those cities are busy, they're crowded, except for the case of maybe Los Angeles or Houston. Um, they're busy, crowded places, full of excitement and constant movement. Here, the bold colors, the bright colors, the warm colors, fighting with the cool colors, help to express that energy, that movement, that tension. There doesn't appear to be a single place, even though the, the objects, rather, the people, look like they're not moving, the colors help to create that sense of movement. And because we don't have a strict sense of shading and texture, we get that sense of tension. We get that sense of uh, realism from simple lines or simple overlapping. Now you might be thinking, wow, that's a really crappy painting. My, my cousin could do that. But as we discussed on, in the Monday, Wednesday class, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, they, they didn't. These were the first people. So it's important to be aware of those mile markers in abstraction. When we think about, you know, the trend going from this to this to this, you know, those, those openings in that door to abstraction are widening and widening. Whereas in Russia, an artist named Vasily Kandinsky decided, why do we even need to paint objects? Why does the painting need to look like something? What if we just let color be color and play around with movement and shape and where color goes and what color can do? Well, he asked the question, he explored it, and his little group of artists, the Blue Riders, later, Dybruka, the bridge, explored that. 
taking away anything that was representational. Now, that's not the only style of art. That's not the one true art form. There is no one overarching art form for this chapter. As I said before, periods, styles, they're going to get shorter, and they're going to be more and more and more as we move up to the contemporary age, because there are more concerns. The world is getting smaller. It's not just about Rome being the whole world, or Europe being the whole world. Now you see influences from other countries, influences from other you know, cities and regions, whether it's Germany, Paris, Russia. Franz Marc, t you know, taking a nod from the symbolists, used color to express certain qualities. You know, color can describe here. Color describes the, uh, actually, hold on a second. Color can describe a thing, right? Very straightforward. The robe is red. The throne is gold. The skin is pale and pasty. Color can express the dude is feeling blue, he's feeling sad. And color can be a symbol. What's, what does red mean? Red means stop, green means go. Franz Marc explored that third route by letting color be symbolic of certain qualities. Looking at these horses, the round behinds, the round bodies, the roundness all around, saw this as qualities of femininity. And so color began to be linked to certain genders, yellow being feminine, blue being masculine, red of course being something else, and green being something else. So he, he blended some of these different things together, creating his own visual language. Now another person that did not belong to Die Brücke or Der Blue Rider or um, the School of Paris is Kathy Kolvitz. And Kolvitz didn't necessarily run with all the other gangs. She did her own thing, creating these very strong, soft, intimate portraits of working class people. They had a very somber or sobering uh, feeling to them, as, you know, color is not being used in these drawings. Color is non existent. So it's a matter of lighting, light and dark, the composition. And when we look at this composition, we're, we know, we're taken back to, you know, the splitting up of the page in a cross type fashion. Or we look at the symbolism or think of the object of the scythe and what it refers to in a uh, European tradition. The scythe typically refers to harvest, could refer to death, it could refer to, you know, any number of things. But in Europe, if you see the scythe, you're going to think of harvest or death. And here we can certainly imagine the hard-working person working the land, getting up at 4 or 5 in the morning just to prepare before the hard day's work. Kolvitz was one of those anomalies, like in every movement. Now, we finish this chapter, and this is a relatively short chapter, with Matisse. Thinking about what all that has happened, color has been used to describe, to express. And in the beginning, Matisse did work to both describe and express. And then he moved to simple flat color. Flat color that was really focusing on emotion and the shapes themselves. Towards the end of this chapter, we can see uh, a, a piece that blends those two shapes together. Now Icarus is simple flat color, but here we have that flat color still working to express depth, forward and back, and volume. And through these arabesques, these dancing shapes, there's still that joy, that movement, that energy that is so pr ever-present in all of Matisse's work. Oh, there's the whole painting. Of course, there are some things worth remembering here. Um, I like to I like to be able to zoom in and show it big when I make a video, and you can better appreciate some of the things going on. But of course, you do need to remember the the, the texts, the walls of texts throughout the presentation. 
after making this many, many times and messing up, hopefully I think this is my best shot. And while it is 15 minutes and it's much shorter than others, it is just as important. I, as always, if you have any questions at all, please don't hesitate to ask. I apologize that it took this long. Life, technical problems, and personal problems of speaking clearly did, of course, get in the way, and I apologize for that. Thank you for your patience, um, and I'll see you in class. Good luck.